Dorothy Day, well, for our Catholic audience, she's one of the trendiest saints. Um, <laughs> one of the trendiest saints of the 21st century for the kids to collect trading cards for. She also has a lot to do with the Spanish flu, which is what we're talking about today in our continuing Making of America series. Part 15? Nine. Yeah, we're calling this episode 15 total, but ignore that. That's way too confusing. I think we're at approximately part nine of the Making of America series. So, listeners, thank you for joining us tonight, and hold on for the wild ride that we have ahead. Wild and thoughtful ride. Again, we do not have our usual host, Landon, so you're going to have to bear with me and my co-host for this evening, Matt Bubonic Plague Schultz, Ross. I I can't think of any um swine flu. Bird, yeah, swine <laughs> flu Johnson and Mike uh never get sick Schaefer. So, uh, thank you for joining <laughs> us here. Um we're doing a little bit of different spin, not exactly a speech uh that's audible, but a speech of the heart is going to be kind of our main focal point platform we're discussing the Spanish flu and making some uh, comparisons to COVID-19. And, of course, thinking them in the context of how um, each of these, but especially the Spanish flu, uh, shaped America, since that's, of course, the mini-series that we're in right now. Um, the letter I found is from – it's technically not from the Library of Congress. Uh, I believe it was, for some reason, stored in uh, New Mexico's archives uh, regarding uh, some Native American um, materials. I think because the young woman who wrote this letter uh, was Native American herself, and she uh, uh, touches on that in this particular letter. This letter that Lucian – I hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly – uh, it's spelled L-U-T-I-A-N-T. She wrote this to her friend, Luis, uh, while she was waiting at the train station in St. Louis, our Union Station, not too far away uh, from me here. Um, the, ner- the letter is sort of fun and interesting because it goes sort of all over the place. Not, not in so- any sort of weird way, but just touching upon the flu itself and uh Lucian's experiences with that, but also her being in love with the soldier. It sounds like it's something out of a movie, uh, which I'm sure we'll touch on some of the details of that a little bit later. Um, And she describes a little bit of just the nature of the flu itself. So uh, without further ado, uh, this letter, it's about about five pages long or so. I'm going to pull out a paragraph uh, to sort of set things up for us here where she describes um, her work as a nurse with some of these flu victims. Here we go. When I was in the officer's barracks, four of the officers of whom I had charge died. Two of them were married and called for their wife nearly all the time. It was sure pitiful to see them die. I was right in the wards alone with them each time, and oh, the first one to die sure unnerved me. I had to go to the nurse's quarters and cry it out. The other three were not so bad, really. Luis, orderlies carried the dead soldiers out on stretchers at the rate of two every three hours for the first two days were there, is how she has it written, but we were there. Two German spies posing as doctors were caught giving these influenza germs to the soldiers, and they were shot last Saturday morning at sunrise. It is such a horrible thing. It is hard to believe, and yet such things happen almost every day in Washington. So that letter is dated October 17th, 1918. The German spies thing kind of surprised me. Like... I, when I was yeah. reading the letter, I, when I was reading the letter for the first time, it's like, oh, a nurse, Spanish flu, and then all of a sudden there were two Ger- like it sounded like an Indiana Jones movie, like there yes. were two German spies, so they got shot. <laughs> Can you imagine if during COVID nineteen, international spies were distributing COVID germs? There would be. <laughs> 
social instability of the nth degree versus here. Yeah, they handled it on the spot. <laughs> Grabbed them and shot them. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I don't – I mean, you mentioned that, like, yeah, there would be social instability. I feel like there would be, but I don't know – I don't know. I really honestly don't know how the public would take that sort of thing just because like there's this uh I don't know. We have the sense of xenophobia here that like they never had. You know, like oh, German spies let's shoot them. We'd be like, "Oh, like Chinese spies probably conspiracy theory." You know what I mean? Like Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty like, sure a spy. I'm pretty yeah, sure a spy, but I don't think I can say that. Well, hold on. What, what was the point you were just saying about xenophobia us compared to them? Well, I guess it, just the the initial thought process for them. Well, I mean, and this like there may or may not have been more legitimacy to this, but they were like German spies posing as doctors. Let's shoot them. Oh, and, like yeah. not make a, not really make a, a a story out of it. Whereas if anything like that were to have happened here, it'd be like Chinese spies must have been a hoax. Yeah. You know, you know, I, I guess that's, that I can't like really this. see. Yeah, I just can't conceivably yeah. imagine. And we we're obviously at war. We were at war with the Germans at that time, too. It's kind of another layer of, I mean, it'd be like if, you know, the Taliban <laughs> had distributed uh, COVID germs. Wow. You know, when I was reading this letter, um, a it reminded me of a couple of things. Uh, one particular thing uh, that I mentioned as kind of the teaser for this episode is it reminded me of Dorothy Day. Uh, Dorothy Day, uh, I think officially blessed Dorothy Day. Um, her life went from, I think, roughly 1880 to, well, I guess, 1890-ish until 1970-ish. Um, so she would have been about Luciance's age here. She also worked as a nurse, I think technically a nurse in training in uh, New York, I think. And it sounds similar, just this emphasis on the intimacy and uh, depth of experience uh, that they had with the Spanish flu. But at the same time, continuing to live their lives um, in fairly ordinary ways, for better or for worse. Um, there is an excerpt that I found which I think sort of captures Dorothy Day's experience as it compares to Luciance's here. Um, and also with sort of the contrast um, that I think will kind of be a little bit of a focal point for our discussion here where you have a disease which objectively was far more deadly, far more prevalent, but being Spanish flu um, compared to the COVID, compared to COVID um, but had a marginal, almost non-existent existence within like the social consciousness, which is completely opposite of COVID where it is, takes up a massive amount of our social awareness, right? Um, so a quote here from Alfred Crosby, I think, really captures that particular idea, which I'm going to read. This is from a an article from the Smithsonian uh, that describes what Alfred Crosby wrote there in the 1976 book, comparing the Spanish flu to uh, COVID. Well, just commenting on Spanish flu. Americans barely noticed and didn't recall, but if one turns to intimate accounts, to all the biographies of those who were not in positions of authority, to collections of letters written by friend to friend, if one asks those who lived through the pandemic for their reminiscences, then it becomes apparent that Americans did notice. Americans were frightened. The courses of their lives were deflected into new channels and that they remember the pandemic quite clearly and often acknowledge it as one of the most influential experiences of their lives. Hmm. What do you guys think is the difference? And that maybe like Mike, if you wanted to go somewhere else, like we can maybe do this uh, later. No, but... no, I no, I have nothing 
pertinent necessarily. The difference in what do you mean? Like, I guess how did I don't know. It's it's curious how. I mean, maybe it's just the middle of World War One, and that like was just the dominant paradigm through which people were kind of viewing their lives and the the country's kind of collective mission. Um, and we don't have anything. We're you know we didn't have anything of that magnitude in the midst of COVID. Um, I don't know. I suppose that's the only thing that comes to mind. But like, how did how did the Spanish flu become something so intimately important, but I guess collectively forgotten? Um, yeah. Whereas COVID, something that I, I, I guess maybe maybe the opposite. Um, not that I mean I know a lot of people have been affected, but. Well, I mean, I, I think the opposite is something that, yeah, I was sort of just alluding to, and I think it's something worth considering in itself. You know, I think the only way people could interact, if you will, with the Spanish flu was like one on one, right? Seeing their loved ones die from it, seeing their patients die from it or be sick from it versus with COVID, you obviously have that. To a lesser degree, though, um, but you're also interacting with it in the digital space, right? And not even just the digital space, you're interacting it, you know, as ridiculous as it is in a conservative way or liberal way, you know, or moderate way for that matter as well. Um you know, so this almost as if like, um, well, yeah, I'll, I'll sort of start there. So I, I, I think that's sort of an interest. So it sort of has its own life of its own in that way. Yeah, I mean, I think I kind of think, yeah, kind of jumping off that, um, like not like, oh, fake news media, but just like the presence of national media that can cover it and spread the news was different. Um, obviously, just technologic, like with technology, we're just much further along. But then kind of like I think we alluded to earlier, like World War One's going on. So, you know, President Wilson doesn't even mention the Spanish flu. Um, so, you know, people, you know, Trump gets a really hard time, not necessarily not, not saying he did a good job at managing it, but, you know, takes a lot of slack for not doing enough. Like Woodrow Wilson never mentioned the Spanish flu, despite the fact that it infected, I think, what was it, 30, was it 33 percent of the population or something? I mean, just huge. Yep. Um so despite the fact that it affects a greater percentage of the population and I think kills pretty much a similar number of people that COVID has, despite, again, a much smaller population, um, the president doesn't even mention it because of probably fear of bad media coverage in the midst of a war. So um, where today it's just in your face, I mean, 24-7, like you said, I mean, one, just the media coverage of it just is constant, but then also, like Mike alluded to, like kind of now we have these uh, conservative and liberal factions that I feel like people just dig their heels in even more and, you know, they they want to have a stronger opinion than maybe they do because they're, you know, uh, it fits well with some other, uh, some group that they want to be a part of or something. But, yeah, I mean, it's, what is it? So we've got 33% of the population gets infected with the Spanish flu versus only 10% with COVID. Um, pretty similar number of that. Both a little over, was it 600,000 deaths for both of them? Um, Closer to 700,000 for Spanish flu. Yep. Okay. But, I mean, not re- same ballpark, we'll put it that way, despite a much smaller U.S. population at the time. Yeah, uh, um, let's let's clarify that as well right now. Present-day American population, you guys should know that one off the top of your heads. 330 million. Yeah, yeah, good. I was going to say 300 19, million. 1918, we're at 103 million. So we're one-third of the population of uh, then. One-third, but... Uh, I guess twelve uh, percent higher death rate. So it was sure. a big deal. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Which interestingly enough, kind of reading about some of the stuff, I feel like you could almost play the game. Like you could read about someone's response, whether it was a town's response to something going on or people's response to masks. Like I feel like we could play a fun game that's like. This is what someone did or said. Was that Spanish flu or COVID? Because some of the things were just, I felt like, eerily the same. Um, 
I th- I'm thinking of the uh, what was it? The, oh, I forget the name. The 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 parade in Pittsburgh or uh, Lo- I forget the name of it. I apologize, but the pretty much Pittsburgh or was it Philadelphia? It was Philadelphia. Sorry, Philadelphia had a some sort of parade planned, and they went ahead with it. And it reminded me of you know, what was that that biker rally in South Dakota, right? People were like, "Don't do it, don't do it," and they went ahead with it. Where like St. Louis at the time of the Spanish flu was on like total lockdown. So just this idea that you know, even within the U.S., people are handling it so differently. And then um, kind of same uh, San Francisco issues a mask mandate, and people got fined. It was five dollars, which I think I looked it up as like eighty nine dollars in today's money. So you get a ninety dollar oh, yes. fine for not wearing a mask and yet they start the what was it called the anti-mask league was that the name of the the group in san francisco and their first their first meeting drew like four to five thousand people so so many people were just like all spanish flu yeah sorry that's spanish flu so i mean you've got again like so oh you've got a oh a town issues a mask mandate there's a fine if you're not wearing it and a large group of people form a coalition of that called the Mm anti-mask league like Again, like I don't. It's just so like, you know, it's Spanish flu or COVID. You know, I mean that that would that kind of information would not have um, you know affected my decision ever to not wear a mask or wear a mask. But you know, so much of our dialogue uh, from professionals on you know here's X, Y, and Z reasons to wear a mask. I would imagine sharing like that kind of history, like you just shared, like that. That seems like that'd be influential information to a large portion of the audience, especially Americans. You know, conservatives, they slash we to some extent are more conscientious people, and so history tends to influence us more. And to know that, hey, you know, America. Actually, it has already had mask mandates before, and it didn't result in a, an utter um, destabilization of of our freedoms. Like, look, there's there's something there. Yeah. I did a little bit of math on the death or percentage of the population who died from COVID versus Spanish flu. The percentage of the U.S. population that died from the Spanish flu was three and a half times as much as the uh, uh, yeah as COVID. So just and what was the straight percentage of our population that died then? So it was point six died from the Spanish flu, zero point six percent of the population. Um. And it was 0.18% of the population died from COVID. Huh. Okay. I now like the I'm curious, like, relative, um, like, how the U.S. did relative to the world with Spanish flu versus COVID. Now I'm interested in that number. Um, but, we, yeah, we don't necessarily... Steve, Steve's off tonight, so <laughs> he's off with Landon, helping uh, plan Landon's wedding. They've gotten real close. Uh, so, to think there. do you guys think though? So, like when I first hear that, it's like, oh, the Spanish flu sounds worse as far as you know, same amount of people, more people died, yet smaller population, so larger percentage population for people that can do math. Um, but we kind of. But like we said earlier, but there wasn't some national narrative during the Spanish flu. So a lot of people kind of just went about their business, right? So had there not been this huge it was it not if it was not hugely discussed in the media and very present and in your face, do you think that if we had just not had that, the COVID numbers would have been worse? Does that make sense? Hmm. Yeah, I mean that's a good question. I mean, the answer would have to be yes, at least to some extent. I just don't know how bad it would be. Somebody might have ran a model or something, but. Ran a model of what exactly? So, like, you know, uh, 
so like when you look at the numbers, the Spanish flu seems worse, right? If you have similar, a higher, I mean, a smaller population, but similar amounts of deaths, right? A higher Mm -hmm. mortality rate, all of that. But at the same time, like we kind of said earlier, like the president never mentions the Spanish flu. And it's not necessarily maybe in the social consciousness as much as COVID. And there maybe aren't these huge lockdowns that we had for the last, you know, for 2020. So had people and the nation acted in the same way in both the Spanish. So I had and people during COVID, the COVID pandemic, have people have people had acted in the same way that they did during the Spanish flu pandemic. Would the numbers have been worse? Does that make sense? Um, and I'm, I like I would I would assume the numbers would have been worse, but I just don't know how you tell how bad they would have been. Yeah, I mean, it'd definitely be interesting to. Yeah, interesting to project. That would be very difficult to like do accurately, though. I imagine. Right. right. I mean, the inputs you you decide on would determine the outputs, and you could probably make a lot of cases for any combination of inputs to to use for that. Yeah. You know, I, I've sort of been thinking about this thought recently, and I think it applies here. Uh, so I'll open sort of this thought experiment. You know, you basically have three general factions and, you know, just using, focusing in on masking. I'm sure there's significant overlap with vaccines as well, but just focus on masking here. You know, you basically have three groups of people in the most simple thought approach to it as possible. People who are going to wear a mask because they're overly fearful. Like, I mean, that's true. That's definitely a percentage of pop- people wear masks for that reason. They're going to jump on it. There's people who are not going to wear masks, period, just because they don't like being told what to do. And then you have a group of people who are going to wear masks, excuse me, masks, because they just listen to what experts say. You know, if it was a, uh, if they were, um, you know, trained to become a strong person, they're going to study what strong people have to say. So they have these three different groups. So the thought experiment is this: if we can agree that those are the only three groups, the only three psychological approaches to wearing masks or not. How much can you realistically believe that these three groups are going to be influenced by the sort of like floating abstract narrative um, that, as Ross was sort of saying, exists much more now, but it seems to have sort of existed to some extent in uh the Spanish flu as well. And if you have these anti-masking leagues emerging, then presumably I'd have to imagine that some sort of language like what we hear today would sort of also exist there. Um, what do you guys think? I, I think I would disagree that those are the three camps. I mean, I think if you look from a 30,000 foot view, I suppose like, yeah, like I, I see what you mean. And I think that might be accurate, but the way mask wearing plays out, I think, happens much more particularly. And there is uh, – so this is coming from Freakonomics in a recent podcast they had. Free advertising for another podcast. All right, whatever. But Freakonomics was talking about um, influence. And they interviewed an author of, a, I guess, a classic book on influence um, who's kind of republished his original work. Anyhow, the uh, – one of the, the studies he cites in his more recent book looks at the behavior of mask wearing and like the number. So after adjusting for all of these different things, even adjusting for political preferences, when you make whatever statistical adjustments for that, the only thing that stood alone as like a standalone factor that predicted mask wearing was the presence of people around you wearing masks. And just like how important it is for people who, who in your social circles to be wearing masks or not wearing them, you know, and I don't know that I don't I mean, human nature certainly has not changed that much um, 
I mean, and, and you're going to have camps of people. So I suppose like the way that breaks down in whatever town had the anti-masking league and the Spanish flu and then whatever towns or, I mean, I suppose sectors of the population, um, it, you know, that it, nowadays that are anti-mask or vehemently pro-mask and, you know, irrational in either direction, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, there's there's a complex social aspect, not in a global sense, but more in like a, yeah, I mean, just you're influenced by the people around you a lot. And I think more than you could probably give credit for. I, yeah. I think we're going to probably jump on the same thought, but I mean, yeah, just to like, I guess I wouldn't have thought of that, honestly, like right off the top of my head. But now that you say that, that certainly seems true. It's like my experience of different groups of people. Because I like, um, so to, like to put a like an actual face on it. I mean, I've got I know people who I guess I feel like are very similar to me in terms of uh, upbringing, culture we grew up in, where we're from, race, socioeconomic status. I mean, like we're pretty similar in thought processes in a lot of ways, and yet act differently on the mask wearing stuff. And it does seem to be highly influenced by, I guess, I mean, you kind of already said it, so I'm just hitting home, but um, it's like we've got some family members that I feel like were much less likely to wear masks than, like, we were, me and my family, and I remember thinking about it, like, couldn't really peg necessarily why, and because I feel like on most things we think pretty similarly, and on that one we seem to think very differently, but, um, yeah, I guess one of the things was just kind of, I guess, where we live, people seem to yeah, I mean, much more or less common, like the people around us, if that makes sense. So when you, I wouldn't have thought about that initially, but like when you said that, I was like, huh, that seems to ring perfectly true to my experience of people wearing or not wearing masks. I think another, like, I don't know if you want to say difference, and I don't know, maybe this isn't an educated enough thought, but just to play with just like the the environment of what's going on at the time. Like, right, we've commented the Spanish flu hits in 19, was it 1918? So kind of the end of the First World War. So people have had four years of, at the time, the largest scale war in human history and more death than probably people want to imagine. So it's kind of like if you want to, like, there wasn't a similar event going on when COVID hit, you know, for people to be comparing it to if that makes sense so it's like yeah maybe somebody you know died from covid but it's like for them it's like if they had that same thing it's like that was maybe a more normal thought is like yeah not everybody's just going to make it to old age right a ton of people died in world war one so there might have been a little bit or just kind of a, I'm fed up with having to deal with stuff right like four one probably sucked for people um all over the place so there there kind of was maybe a little bit like when we talk about the social conscious i just think they had things going on that frankly we probably can't really relate to um and we're having to kind of compare the spanish flu too where with covid we just don't seem to have a similar uh yeah just a, a similar thing going on so they had world war one they had spanish flu um, what else happened in 1918, especially that uh, a lot of Catholics might be aware of? I hate, I hate it when you put us on the spot and we don't know you the answer. You do this all the time, Mike. What the heck? I, I didn't even <laughs> what else happened on September 16th, 1918 at 4.30 in the morning? <laughs> Nobody? 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 How could you not know? Our Lady of Fatima. Appeared. Oh. Oh, uh, okay. yeah, okay. Can you imagine the people in Fatima, Portugal, World War One's going on, there's the Spanish flu, the Virgin Mary is appearing, causing the sun to be... They, they couldn't have just thought the world was ending, they knew the world Gosh, holy <laughs> smokes, dude, when you put it that way. <laughs> How are there not riots in all yeah. of Portugal? Man, yeah, I'm just... Like, well, you guys probably know. Portugal's near Spain, right? Spain wasn't hit as hard by the Spanish flu. <laughs> That's true, yes. Great little... Wait, Spain wasn't hit by the Spanish flu? What? I don't get uh, it. Duh, because they were neutral during the war, and so all they talked about was the flu. That's what everyone else called it, the Spanish flu. 
great part. Too. Um, yeah, I was just listening to this great podcast. Um, it's like the unsolved mysteries, and there's some crazy ones, but they actually devote two episodes to Our Lady of Fatima. And um, yeah, not to <laughs> uh, go too much off track here, but man, they they were left pretty stumped. There is there's a lot to those miracles that are still impossible to explain. But anyway, well, they had like thousands of eyewitnesses, right? Yeah, I mean that is documented, one hundred percent true. Yeah, tens of thousands, I think seventy thousand witnesses uh, is is what I've heard. And yeah, I mean they, um, yeah, dancing sun. The sun painting colors uh, in the sky, um, which I, some visitors still see uh, today, uh, actually. But, yeah, crazy, crazy one, for sure. Hmm. Let's, this, uh, oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, let's, I'm interested in just this girl's story, that Lucian, so back, kind of coming back to the letter, because... Um, so one experience I had kind of like as COVID was just unveiling and our hospital system just sent out a few like fairly dire emails kind of like outlining that, you know, things are shutting down people who are not in, you know, immediately necessary positions will be reassigned to whatever is needed. Um, and there's this kind of like dire atmosphere and I just heard a, a number of different things from a number of different people and I kind of had this vision of having to like serve as a nurse like an unqualified but slightly more qualified than the average person uh, just being a physical therapist uh, that like oh shoot like we're gonna like this is what I might have to do and I'm gonna be watching people die or I'm gonna be unloading trucks full of medical supplies in the pouring rain or, you know, like just different, like, Matt, scenarios. where's your biohazard? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I don't know. It, but like this, this gal like actually lived it. Um, yeah, I guess that was the first thing that I thought of with just like reading this girl's letter, um, and just her experience with, with like having to face death and, I don't know. There's part of me that was like thinking about that and not like, I don't know. I don't think it was completely like, like Don Quixote, like fantasy. Like there was some level of, of, uh, legitimacy to like, you know, just the uncertainty of the situation, you know? Um, yeah, I guess that was kind of my first thought, just kind of trying to picture myself and her story. And I, I felt like I, could picture the possibility, but obviously never lived it out. But anyway, what's interesting, I guess, too, from that <clears throat> kind of like you, well, you mentioned like being in the hospital, it kind of made me think of. I remember, so I worked at a hospital during, um, I guess the worst of COVID, and um, I remember doing the surge last fall, right? So that's when the numbers got bad, at least in our area. Um, like our hospital actually did, like we were concerned with being over full. Like there was this like legitimate concern of not having enough beds for the people. Um, so I think when COVID first hit in that spring of 2020, I, the most patients we had, I mean, I think we had like 32 COVID patients in like a three month window. So, I mean, not very many. And then I think at one point, like on a single day last year, we had like well over a hundred in one day. Um, so just the numbers just shot up. And I remember like there did seem to be just a kind of a sense of, uh, just kind of people were kind of worn down. They were kind of ready to be done with it. They were tired. Um, they were frustrated, all of that. But then, I don't know, like, I feel like reading, what, are, what Lucin, Lucient, what is her name? Lucient. Lucient, sorry, reading Lucient's letter, like, I feel like I have a hard time really, like, bringing out how she felt about the situation. Cause like I said, when we were in like in the quote unquote, the thick of it at the hospital, like there was definitely like high stress levels. People were frustrated. Um, the hospital had had to cut a lot of people because just they lost a lot of money. Um, so just, I don't know. There's just a, definitely like a weariness, I guess. 
and like reading her letter, like I definitely think some of that comes out. Like she talks about going to a different room and crying. So, I mean, she's not enjoying the experience, but like at the same time, she later in the letter, you know, she talks about Washington being a beautiful place. Um, the aviation field is another very interesting place. Airplanes fly over the city at all hours of the day. Like kind of in some ways, she just described like it almost sounds like a postcard, like she's just describing a normal experience. Um, so I, I feel like I had a little bit like, you know, when you're said like you wanted to dive into Lucian's life, I feel like I had a little bit of a hard time really pinpointing like her, I guess, overall experience of the Spanish flu, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I don't know if that if that resonates or not, but or if you guys had a similar thought. It's interesting to take a look here. I think the letter was written. Uh, Spanish flu officially started early 1918. So they're about eight months in. Uh, they have about two years still. Yeah, about two years still. So, man, it would be interesting, sort of like what you're saying, Ross, is to see what was going on with her by the end of the Spanish flu. Um, you know, it's, I sort of have to visit these things. Who knows what might come of them. I guess some things that sort of struck me about her letter, you know, one, if she were alive today, she would be about 120 years old, which is, would tie the world record of 122 years old, roughly, ever for an American. Um, but it seems like she's just about within spinning distance of my grandparents, um, my grandparents were all born shortly after this in the early 1920s. And she, among um, recounting her experience in the hospitals in her letter, she also recalls just this extraordinarily serendipitous event of meeting this guy, this soldier at Union Station in St. Louis. Um, you know, rather than trying to, to describe it, I'm just going to uh, use her own words here. Um, let me go ahead and find my spot. I have a very dear soldier friend who is stationed at Potomac Park, Lieutenant Cantrell. It was so funny how we first met. I was completely lost in St. Louis at the Union Station and simply had no idea where I was going, just wandering around the station to pass away hours there and waiting for my train. Finally, I thought of sending Odile a telegram, too. I waited, waited, and waited and could not get in to send one, so I picked up my suitcase and traveling bag and started towards the ladies' waiting room. Instead of taking my own traveling bag, I left mine and picked up this soldier's bag. They were as much alike as two peas, and I was so tired I never took special notice, but I thought I had my own bag. When I opened it to get out my comb and powder, behold, there was a kit bag fully equipped in a knitted sweater in it, plus a few other trinkets. I knew then whose bag I had, so I checked my suitcase and started to look for the soldier and exchange bags as I thought he had mine. So anyway, he eventually find, she eventually finds this guy. They switch up bags. He figures out that he's on the same train as her to Washington. Um, <laughs> and we'll pick up where she continues uh, talking about him. He has been down to our house twice to see me since I came back from Camp Humphreys, and he sure wants me to come down to Potomac Park as a nurse. He is not what one would call handsome, um, but he is certainly good-looking. And on top of all that, he is a Catholic, all uppercase font. That was her words. Sure like it for myself, too. All the girls have soldiers. Indian girls also. Some of the girls have soldiers and sailors, too. The boys are particularly crazy. Girls tell us that the Indian girls are not so easy as the white girls. So I guess maybe that's their reason. Anyway, it reminded me, um, in a sort of that serendipitous sense, how my own grandparents met on my mom's side. Um... They, I was just asking my grandma about this, uh, last week or week and a half. Um, she was walking out of work on Belleville's Main Street. 
he was walking down the street. He was serving World War II. I don't know that he had his uniform on, but I sort of like to imagine it. He's walking down the street with, like, two other friends. And he ran into each other. And they started talking, and they walked together for a little bit. And about another week or two later, uh, they ran into each other again as she walked out of the park there. So just that sort of, like, serendipitous way that they met and uh, obviously fell in love and got married. So anyway, that sort of bit of the human story in the midst of this pandemic sort of struck me. I think that there's something kind of beautiful about that, and in particular thinking about, I think, something that we have struggled with during COVID, like figuring out how to be kind of conscious of, you know, our neighbor and how to, you know, um, you know, how to be charitable and respectful of other people and, you know, not try to spread a killer disease, but at the same time, like life goes on, you know, so like for this Lucian, right, she's on the front lines of the Spanish flu. She is in Washington, D.C., at Washington, D.C., right, acting as a nurse with people who are sick. And yet, you know, she's also talking about finding this cute soldier that she likes, um, not handsome, but or wait, however she worded it. Um, but I think that there's just something, I don't know, kind of just human about that. Like, yeah, so she's living through World War One and being away from home and the Spanish flu and, you know, all these terrible things. And yet at the same time, it's like, yeah, she's still, yeah, she's still just kind of able to move on with her life um, in some way. And I think that that's, I don't know. I found that personally, I think I found that challenging during the COVID pandemic is like how to, you know, kind of walk the line and not be rash and, you know, like potentially spread a killer disease to people who could die. And yet at the same time, not just shut myself in a hole and, you know, hope it goes away. Um, uh, yeah. So I don't know if that, there's a thought there or not, but I, when I'm kind of reading about that, I just, again, I think her letter was just kind of a lot of different things could be pulled out of it. Um, is there a relationship between the religiosity of Black Lives Matter and COVID? I know, controversial question, but it's, it's worth talking about, right? It's worth talking about. Um, can that, you ask the question one more time so I can... Yeah, I guess. Is there a relationship between the religiosity of Black Lives Matter and COVID? So... Think about that question. It's it's a little bit less out of the blue than um, just simply my thoughts. Uh, this is from a, an article from the Smithsonian, which uh, compares COVID to the 1918 pandemic. Yale sociologist and physician Nicholas Christakis hypothesizes that the 1918 pandemic falls into an ages-old pandemic pattern. One that our COVID-19 present may mimic, too. In his 2020 book, Apollo's Arrow, The Profound and Enduring Impact of Coronavirus on the Way We Live, uh, he argues that increasing religiosity, risk aversion, and financial saving characterize times of widespread illness. Um, Just to set things up a little bit more here, um, again, it is, it is controversial, um, where, but it's also really important, uh, too, to try talking about in as academic and serious way, uh, if nothing else is possible. Um, you know, we live obviously in a world that seems to have little use for like official religion, right? And just put everything out there, uh, we're dealing with one, uh, gr- one, uh, seminarian who discerned out, one guy whose brother is a fantastic priest, one guy who, um, well, it doesn't fall in either of those categories, but <laughs> as these other two guys does, take, takes his faith, Catholic faith, 
pretty seriously. So kind of uniquely, you know, we take religion fairly seriously, but a lot of our peers don't today, right? And it's just simple observation, right? Not many people go to church every Sunday anymore. Um, but I was listening to <laughs> another podcast with a guy named Michael Shermer, uh, who's an atheist, and he was talking about Black Lives Matter, anti-racism, um, in the academic sense of word, anti-racism. We're all anti-racist, I like to think, in the like most general sense of the word, but in this more sort of modern sense. And anyway, there was something on there that one of the people whom he was interviewing said made me say, like, whoa, I've thought and said the exact same thing. It was this idea that what she was postulating, and Michael Shermer didn't seem to reject outrightly, even though he, he was an atheist, is that what she said was that this loss of religion, official, uh, official sort of mainstream religion, you know, in the past 30 or 40 years, like, created a kind of vacuum, a social, cultural vacuum, that the fact is people need religion. We need rituals. We need things to believe in because simply we just can't prove everything, right? And the point that she was trying to make is that the way that these anti-racist behaviors and beliefs move in society and move in people, she thought it was strikingly similar to the way that traditional religion tends to move in people, kind of rejecting facts um identity becoming something very, very important. Um so all these things being said, I'm sorry gonna cut myself off there, give you guys an opportunity to uh to share some thoughts related to this topic. At first, when you brought that up, I was like, where the heck is that coming from compared to what Ross just said? But as you explained it more, I think, I think there's like, I don't know, I think there's a very profound connection in that. So like what the pandemic made us, so Ross was talking about like the human elements, right? So this girl finding, um, a guy she's interested in. I mean, who knows how the story ends up? Um, I'm know. pretty sure they fell in love and got I, married. I mean, yeah. And it was I'm, a happy ending. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is too. Um, <laughs> So assuming that's the case, because there's no other reasonable end of that story. Um, there, there are these human elements that are always uh, essential to the soul of an individual. And what COVID made us do, and what I think the Spanish flu perhaps did as well, is made us actually try to quantify or calculate what are the costs like what is it that we would pay to be human or what and what is it that we'll give up um to kind of preserve humanity um in a more general sense and i think what black lives matter and i think part of why it was i mean i think they're just the circumstances of you know, a number of controversial police actions. Like, I think that it just the circumstances of that coming up. Um, but also, I think COVID exacerbated just our desire for just human experience and human things. Um, the desires to be together, desires for gathering, um, for education, for progress, civic engagement, whatever you want to call it. Um, I feel like just in the vacuum of that um, with COVID and then as Mike mentioned, like kind of the more cultural, I guess, longer term vacuum of um, like religious experience. Um, I guess like, yeah, I, I, it makes perfect sense that Black Lives Matter and just religious wokeness in general um, for any of those kind of I ideological, uh, I don't know, interests, um, I think is, yeah, is just a manifestation of human beings seeking 
human things again. You know, seeking them again in relation to the absence of religion, but also seeking them again in relation to months of forced um, disengagement from that. Hey, very well said, Matt. Hey, I think that's, yeah, excellent. Yeah, it's, yeah, I've, let, tr- let me try to back myself, um, cause I don't, I don't want you to say things that seem off the cuff. The reason that, uh, uh that I make this correlation between religiosity and certain, um, uh, public expressions of Black Lives Matter is, you know, one that I was just talking to someone recently regarding the number of unarmed African Americans killed by police officers. I believe um, it was something like 15. I'm going to get the exact number on this just so that I think it's fair to say somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 25. Yeah, I mean, like that, I know, that's I, I know it's somewhere 15 of, to right? maybe 30 if you want to make it yeah. just a little more. And clear, but. it's gone down. I've, and obviously every single one of those deaths is tragic and should be prevented to every possible degree. But um, that, that has even gone down significantly. I think it was like 45 – dozens upon dozens in like the I think past decade or something um here's bring us home what do we have in store well we know what was in store uh for the pandemic 1920 1930 uh all of my grandparents were born uh but we had uh let's see I think this sounds like something Matt would write uh, troops came home, women got the votes from the 19th Amendment. Jazz happened. Radios, uh, that was Ross. That was Ross. I didn't Native write anything Americans on this one. Native Americans became citizens of the U.S. People got cars. <laughs> and we realized we were having too much of a good time, and we created prohibition at the end of the decade. Ooh. Yeah, that's crazy when my grandma, grand parents, my grandma was still alive was a kid. So it was illegal to drink alcohol. Wrong. Uh, it was illegal to purchase or sell alcohol. Oh, You could right. technically drink it. Yeah, that's right. Sounds There's good. a fun quip that somebody, like, beforehand, like, stockpiled and had, like, a ton of alcohol <laughs> because it was um, technically, I think it was technically illegal to drink. You just couldn't buy and sell, I think. Yeah. What do our next 10 years store? Well, we already have jazz. Women already vote. Um, but, you know, I was reading some articles on this, and the point that they sort of made was that a lot of these things that created a roaring 20s were sort of like fomenting for decades. It wasn't, it wasn't, it did not seem obvious that the virus was their primary perpetrator or a cultivator of these things. But, Anyway, what are some things you guys see for the next 10 years? Maybe we can sort of hone in on our own lives, uh, how we see them being affected by COVID, how we behave. I think it makes me more ready to stockpile for the apocalypse that's inevitable. This was just a test. I mean... Not really, but yeah. I I feel like, I don't know if this is a privileged thought or just an anti-climatic answer to your question, but like, I mean, what do the next 10 years look like for me? Not really any different than they did before. I mean, uh, still going to do my exact same job. I'm still in the same house. Probably going to, I mean... It's not going to affect how many kids I have. I, I know. I, I, I feel like it's an interest. I mean, I think it's an interesting point that I'm saying it the way I am. So I hope it's coming through correctly. But like, I don't see myself living that much differently as if COVID happened or didn't once we get over the pandemic. Um, I don't know if that's a thought. I, yeah, I don't know if that's an interesting thought or not, but yeah. 
So I think realistically that's probably what's going to happen. But my stupid comment about the apocalypse was not entirely in jest because I think it's at least opened up my mind to the possibility that our world could drastically, drastically change. You know, like obviously, I, I mean, looks like this is going to be a relatively temporary ish thing. Like there's definitely going to be some long-term fallout, um, like general society wise. And I mean, who knows what the general fallout was from the Spanish flu? Well, you know, like I know we talked about, I don't know if this was recorded or not, but like the talk about risk and how that might've been a, a thing, um, that, that culturally changed after the Spanish flu, you know, did that lead to the great depression? You know, where you have people who are risk averse and not willing to invest in the stock market and very skittish when the stock market starts to crash, you know. Um, All right. So like that's that's a scenario that I don't know, maybe that'll play out. Um, But it's at least made me, I think, open to the possibility that like life could dramatically change because like no one saw this coming. No one saw um, a society changed and turn on its head like it has been. Um, and like, okay, so what are the things that are really important? What are the things that, um, are going to make like a multi-generational impact on the world? You know, if, uh, our world looks a lot different. So I don't know. I think it's at least made me start to think about what, what is it that I'm investing in? What is it that I'm, um, doing and how I'm spending my time? I think it, Yeah. I think that's a little critical thought. Two reasons why that's funny is it kind of looks like you're in like a deep stone basement right now. <laughs> like, are you in a bunker? <laughs> this is the bunker. I mean, yeah. it's just a I mean, it's, stone wall. Like, could be. Well, that's our apartment for the next uh, three <laughs> weeks. So, three weeks we will have an actual house no, with a desk to broadcast from. And second funny point, I did legitimately think it was either yesterday or today. Like I really, I had the thought, like, huh, you know, this happened, and everybody wanted some, some wanted some N ninety fives, and you couldn't find them. Like now that the mask mandates are over, like I legitimately was like, I think I could probably buy a bunch of cheap N ninety fives. Cause so <laughs> I almost went on Amazon. I think it was yesterday, and was like, huh, I wonder how many if I could buy like fifty of those for cheap, just in case. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I can definitely identify with your answer, Matt. Yeah, and just, yeah, simple ways like buying a house. It's like, yeah, I, I live in a humble apartment here. And, like, being in an apartment, like, man, that's probably one of the highest risk places you can be, in a sense. Because apocalypse comes, you live in a house. No one's going to come and take that away from you, even if it's not fully paid off. An apartment, my landlord is probably going to kick me out and use it to store guns or something like that. <laughs> right? Um, I wash my hands a lot better uh, than I used to. And I, th- I think I'm going to continue doing that probably, at least for a while. Um, That's a good pickup line. You should use that. (laughs) (laughs) I always wash my hands, just to be clear to the audience. After camping Um, with you as many times as I have, I just don't believe that. (laughs) (laughs) Camping's a different story. Uh, Different rules in camping. But anyway, yeah, those those are some of the things there. It'd be fun to hear from our listeners. Um, Listeners, why why don't you shoot us an email using the email you can find on our website. We can uh, check those out, hear how your life has changed. So, Why don't you just so. say the email in case our listeners don't feel like going to our website? I, I don't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, listeners. We check it regularly. So with that, any closing thoughts, ladies and gentlemen? Gentlemen, mostly. We have successfully sketched out the formation of America in the early 20th century. Coming up next, we have somewhere in the probably pre-World War II period, hosted by 
We have something coming up in the pre-World War II period, hosted by... That would be me. I think it's Ross. <laughs> Ross. We'll come up with some, some gem there. Probably the beginning of King Roosevelt's reign, 50-year reign as king, something like that. Right. Folks, it's, it's been fun. great. It's been great <laughs> chatting with you tonight. As usual, we can't wait to visit with you again in a few weeks and uh, continue seeing how America unfolds.